my roommate, Donald Lyons, who was from Washington, D.C., had heard about the incident. And uh, I'm, I'm not sure where he heard it, because uh, there was very little TV at the time. Uh, and he suggested that we would go down the next day. And so we did. You know, and there was a picture of him sitting at the lunch counter. So we went down. We went down that second day, and we continued to go back. I didn't have any student leadership roles on campus, but we became part of the uh, Student uh, Executive Committee for Justice, which was kind of the, uh, the umbrella organization that uh, oversaw the direction for the, the movement after, after they sat down. And a couple of days later, Crest Store, the Crest Store, was added. So we split our time between Crest and Woolworth. That first week is is kind of the, the big thing because things escalated. By that Saturday, you're talking almost a thousand people from Bennett to A&T who marched downtown to both stores. And we were inside of both Crest and Woolworth. Crest was the first store to close. The A&T football team had won the conference championship and they had just received their blue and gold jackets and so Chris was in the basement and that's where I was sitting and there was some uh, heckling coming from some of the whites in the crowd, some of the young whites in the crowd but then all of a sudden there was this hush silence and when we looked at the top of the steps there were the football team standing you know, two abreast. I never forget that because there they were at the top of the steps, just standing there. And then as they began to, to descend. And uh, the manager jumped up and said, this store is closed. So we all filed out, went up to Woolworth and went into the side door and, and into the store. There was some jostling, there's a, there's a clip of me being pushed by somebody. And shortly after that, uh, the manager announced that a bomb threat had been called in and the store was closed, so we left. So at that point, that was when we called the moratorium. And so there wasn't any more demonstrations until April 1st. You know, they wanted a chance to talk and run away. They didn't do anything, so on April 1st, we resumed the demonstrations. The launch counter was closed. We began to picket people being transported downtown or walking downtown to participate in, in the pickets. April the 21st, we came back to the depot, sat down, had a meeting, and made a decision that we were going to go into the restaurants and sit at the lunch counters even though they were closed. And so we were asked to leave and we didn't. The police came, they came with their paddy wagon the Black Mariah, as they called it. And so the 45 students who were arrested, we were carried downtown to the police station. And we were booked, mug shots, uh, we were fingerprinted. Uh, we were detained uh, uh, several hours, a couple hours. Mrs. Goldie Hargett, who owned a Hargett funeral home, and Dr. B.W. Barnes, who was a dentist, came down and bailed us out. Together, they bailed out with 45. Yeah. From the point of their sitting down, the actual demonstrations and the planning was left to the Student Executive Committee for Justice. The 60 demonstrations desegregated four facilities. Everything else in, in Greensboro was still segregated. That was Cress, Woolworth, Myers Tea Room, and I think a Walgreen uh, drugstore. There are three three different events, but people have now kind of mailed, they all kind of mailed together, you know. That was 19, the sit-ins of 1960. That was the movie theater demonstrations of 1961. And then there was the mass demonstrations of 62, 63, where you had thousands of people being arrested. And in fact, we had more people arrested in Greensboro, they didn't place else in the South. People know about Birmingham and Montgomery because of the 
the fire hoses and, and the dogs and that kind of thing, the bombing of uh, the church in Birmingham. But in terms of volume, numbers of people in the street, people in the rest, of Greensboro did that. Porgy and Bess was playing at the uh, cinema theater on Tate Street. It's now that bookstore. And Pearl Bailey was the the star in the in Porgy and Bess. So there were four students. Myself, Charles Olson, my roommate Don Lyons, and Robert, uh, Pat Patterson, and Bill Thomas. The five of us went to, to the cinema and we were denied uh, entrance, so we began to pick it. And um, we began to, to go back. Again, Bennett and students, Bennett students and ENT students came on in, other Bennett and ENT students came on in. So we began to um, pick it on a regular basis. The National Theater, the um, Carolina Theater, and the Center Theater downtown. The Center Theater is where the end club is. The blacks can, couldn't go in there at all, either that or the cinema, but you know, you could go to the National and to the Carolina. And by the way, we were joined by the Klan out there. And that's what I was telling we we, we had this struggle with them. Um, at ENT about meeting places, so we moved our activities to Bennett. And that continued until the, uh, until school was out, and things just kind of dropped. So things didn't pick up again until uh, the spring of 1962 when CORE started their Freedom Highway Project. CORE, Congress of Racial Equality, which had sponsored Freedom Rides was doing what they call their Freedom Highway Project. They were challenging Howard Johnson's and hot shops along the Eastern Sea. Okay. There was a demonstration on at, in Chapel Hill on uh, 501 at the Howard Johnson. And so we carried a busload of people from Greensboro right now to participate on, in that demonstration. On, it was a Sunday afternoon. So after we got back that week, we decided to organize a Greensboro chapter of CORE. Um, and Bill Thomas was elected the chairman, I was elected the vice, first vice chairman, and Robert Pat Patterson was the second vice chairman. And so we began that summer to meet on a regular basis. Our meeting, um, the meeting place was in the basement of Providence Baptist Church. And a number of the uh, women at Bennett had been students at Dudley who were participating in the 1960 demonstration, but they were now at at, uh, at Bennett. So they formed they helped form the nucleus of the core chapter, and so they brought other Bennett women in, and then uh, other people from ENT. We had these mass arrests, and the women, uh, you where know, well, the students were carried down to the uh, polio hospital, and there weren't any uh, facilities. Women like Mrs. Uh, Feaster, uh, Minnie Feaster, they would come to uh, over to uh, the Redeemer and prepare sandwiches and food. And the community fed the uh, the students who were incarcerated. They collected uh, uh, toiletries and things and carried them down there. Doctor Blair, I remember one one day she had right after the first mass arrest, she had gone down to visit the young ladies and she came by the uh, the church. <laughs> people were in the kitchen preparing food so she sat there in the chair with her uh, tailored blue suit and a little peel box hat <laughs> talking about I had just finished visit the ladies. Dr. Player, though she supported us, her first obligation was to see that we were educated. However, when several of the Bennett um, women were arrested in the marches and so forth, she got up in chapel and said if she had to confer degrees in jail, she would. But she made sure that she sent your homework to wherever you were detained and your personal items. <laughs> so going over into the fall of 62, we have all the students back now. So we began to target places like the uh, s &W, uh, cafeteria, which was downtown next to the Belts store. That was a Mayfair cafeteria. So 
in the fall of 62, uh, we began to step up the, uh, the demonstrations. Thanksgiving Day of 62, a number of us got arrested from Bennett and NT at the uh, Mayfair cafeteria and the s and cafeteria, which is on Market Street. Mayfair was on uh, North Elm Street. Things continued to escalate. So by early spring of 63, we had thousands of people in the streets and we had these silent marches that would start at Hayes Taylor and people would just walk, they walk downtown, back to Hayes Taylor, people were still moving toward downtown. And that continued, but by this time, in late April, Jesse Jackson joined the movement as a participant. Uh, Jesse, his oratorial ability was able to, uh, you know, stir the crowd and, and draw people. So he began to march, and a lot of times you see him at the head of the line. The latter part of the May, uh, a decision was made that we needed to do something different. That, that we were not doing anything to force the mayor uh, to come to the table. So on the uh, 5th of June, where the marchers had always been silent, we decided to sing and clap hands and things. And so when you went downtown, there are more buildings downtown than all these vacant lots. So when, when the uh, claps were reverberating off the, uh, the building, there's an awesome sound. And we just didn't go down and turn around. And, and before, we would always notify this police captain, his name was Jackson, of what we were our intention. We didn't tell him that night. We just started weaving in and out of downtown. We got in front of the uh, police station, and we ordered everybody to sit down in the street. And Captain Jackson freaked out. Because <laughs> usually he had been in control. And uh, he ordered us out. And so we said, Jesse, pray. And Jesse offered a prayer, so that kind of stopped them. They, they froze, you know. And so we got up and we started back to Ace Tell. The next morning, uh, Captain Jackson came looking for Jesse, saying they had a, uh, a warrant for his arrest for citing to ride him. But Jesse wasn't there, and uh, she was at uh, Mr. Ellis Corbett's house over on Bimbo Road. And myself and I think maybe Pat Patterson went by to get him. But in the meantime, the people that the Church of the Redeemer called the news media, and we had this impromptu meeting when Jesse got there. And he was talking to the crowd, and the cameras all there. And uh, then we called Captain Jackson and told him that he was at church waiting on him. There are two pictures. One is Jesse walking with um, Captain Jackson. But there's a, the first picture is when Jesse comes out the door, he sticks his hands out to Captain Jackson, and you can see, kind of see chat. Captain Jackson kind of followed it back. <laughs> so anyway, they carried him off to jail, you know. And so that hit the news. So that night, we had this massive crowd. And that's just that's these pictures of people sitting in the street at the, at the crossroads of Market and, and Elm Street. That ended segregation in Greensboro that night. <laughs> 